record. Hello, and welcome to Jason Kavnis Experience. I'm your host, Jason Kavnis. Our guest today is Ali Schwanke. Ali, are you ready to be great today? I sure am. Let's do this. Ali is the CEO and Chief Marketing Strategist of Simple Threat, a content marketing agency that helps B2B and SaaS companies break through the noise and get better results from their content marketing programs. She has 15 plus years of experience in marketing as an entrepreneur. Ali says she's had her fair share of HR wins and challenges. Learn how she put strategy first, whether that's recruiting new employees or generating results for clients, plus best practices for your content to stand out from the competition. Ali, thank you for being here today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to chat about content marketing and all things content related. So if we go any further, um, I got a public thank you, Ali. So about a month ago, I posted on LinkedIn that I needed some user, user design tests from our website. Not only did I did become a, a tester, she also shared on her social media. And I got, like, I think, up to five testers from Ali's post. So thank you very much for that. Yeah, you're welcome. I know I've, I've been on that side of things where you got to find people that are real life testers. And uh, so I was happy to share and I'm glad people took you up on it. Yes. So Ali, you were just recently uh, named as host of HubSpot Hub Hacks, correct? Yeah, we launched that uh, that series, it's HubSpot Tutorials, and uh, I think we just hit 1,500 subscribers on YouTube recently, so it's growing strong. So, Ali, talk about, uh, your, you actually have two companies now, correct? Yeah, we have, I have an agency that, um, we are a, a content marketing agency for B2B and SaaS companies. Um, again, back to that bio, helping them break through the noise with their contents and, and create content that performs. And then uh, we've been working on a, a software platform for marketing strategy, and that's called Brand Plan. And we've been working on that for about the last year and uh, currently growing our wait list as we finish the product itself. So... How, so do you, you started the Simple Strat before Brand Plan, correct? I did, yeah. Simple Strat started uh, about four years ago and it came out of a, um, I mean, the, the name obviously has strategy short uh, in it, but uh, it came out of a need to to want to get people back to that foundational aspect and um, then really build off of that to uh, create programs that don't just like answer the quick win side of things, but they get them uh, long-term growth opportunities as well. So started that and then um, found the opportunity to, to weave software into that, which is where brand plan came from. So Ali, most people can't handle working nine to five <laughs> and even more can't even handle one startup. You have basically two companies, like how are you doing this? Like you're not sleeping or what's going on here? Yeah, if there's one question that I've gotten in my career, it's when do you sleep? And I think just uh, I'm very type A. And uh, as we record this, we are going through the, you know, everyone's locked in their houses and can't leave. So if you listen to this further down the line, hopefully we're out in society and, and going to the parks and ball games again. But, uh, uh, you know, yesterday I joked that I'm going stir crazy and it's only day like number six. So, yeah, uh, I just have a lot of energy and um, always want to solve problems. I think that's kind of what it boils down to. So has, is marketing your background? Um, well, it's funny because I wanted to be a surgeon uh, in college. And so I studied pre-med and um, I, I do love, love, love solving problems. And I think really great marketers solve problems and they look at the whole world as a problem, not like a campaign to be launched. Right. And so uh, when I, when I graduated college, I went back and studied a lot more about um, photography and design. And I really got into like the visual side of communications. And then once I went back and studied more about business, um, it just kind of like all came together in this wonderful, like scientific experiment blends with uh, creativity. And that's really well where, where I fell in love with that. And then, and then kind of opportunities just came because I think I was good at it. And obviously here I am today, so. Can you define marketing for us? Uh, well, it's funny. I wrote a, an email uh, that's going to go out tomorrow to all of our like business owner people on our, on our contact list. But um, I define marketing as um, creating value for your customers that ultimately ends in a relationship. And, and t today we see that as obviously like a buying experience. But um, even now, like Jason, you're, you're building an audience, creating value. And one could say that's marketing. Um, even if you don't have a, a Facebook page, if you promote it in some way uh, and create value, that, that's marketing. So, um, Allie, on your LinkedIn, you, you, had a, you did, I think, a post about a time how you hired your first employee. Can you <laughs> talk about that a little bit? I thought it was a really, that was a really great story. Can you talk about a little bit how he's grown in your company? Yeah, yeah. So, so four years ago, I um, a little more than 
like four years and a couple months, um, I had decided to move away from, I was doing solo consulting, like CMO for hire kind of thing. So I go into a company, help them figure out their strategy, help them build their team and then, and then somewhat move out. Um, and I decided that I wanted to build an agency cause I kept having to, to, you know, kind of play this like master recruiter all the time. And that really wasn't my strength. So, um, so I put up a posting uh, I, I launched Simple Strat the company, put up my first job posting for a marketing assistant, and I had some good applicants, but I'd never, I'd hired people in previous jobs, but I'd never actually like shelled over my own money to hire someone that I'm now paying their taxes, paying for their desk and paying for, like, it's just, it's a big first step if anybody's never had an employee. And so uh, I interviewed this guy and he was, um, he was one of those like dream employee kind of people that I couldn't believe he would apply to this like what felt like I was kind of playing house still at that point. Like, Ooh, I have a business and now I'm going to hire an employee. Uh, but he applied and he was a great interview. I interviewed him at Starbucks and I remember calling him and just freaking out that he was going to say no because it was too much of a risk. And, um, and he didn't, he said yes. And we negotiated on his starting salary. And four years later, he's, he's like one of the best people, like just a awesome leader on our team. And he has grown tremendously. And I can't imagine, you know, the company without him. Yeah, I find it interesting. Like you, you were basically scared to death that, that he's going to tell you no. <laughs> like you're like, you know, this guy's going to tell me no. What am I going to do? I, I thought that was very interesting. Yeah, I feel like um, you know, the further you get along in your entrepreneurial career, you you build up this like this thick skin of 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 you know, you kind of expect people to say no um, instead of expecting them to say yes. And and I did. I in that post I wrote that I was actually driving when he called me back, and I had to pull over because I was afraid that if he told me no, that I was like okay, I don't know what to do now, but obviously he said yes. And so um, when he said yes, I almost had more silence on the phone because I was, I was surprised like, than I was. Like you said, yes. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm like, are you sure? But uh, yeah, obviously it's, it's been a good, good road for him as well. So. so Ali, you know, a lot of people are like, talking about sales as important, you know, always be closing, but I, I'm a firm believer. You, you know, you saw, so like, AB I'll always be recruiting because you always got to build a talent for your bench, talent for your bench and, you know, bring people on. Can you talk about how you've done that for your company? Yeah, I think that um, that advice, you know, Jason, I, I wholeheartedly believe, uh, wholeheartedly believe that myself. Um, I think that when I was on the employee end, I remember, um, I remember one company that I uh, I got asked to join their team after I'd left a previous job. And this was kind of the, the thing that drove it home for me is this person had said, yeah, we, we've been watching you for a while and we wanted to recruit you, but we were afraid that we would, they were a client of that company. And they're, they were like, we were afraid that we were going to offend them if we actually tried to recruit you. And so what it, what it told me as an owner is people are looking um, and watching your performance long before you're ready to make a move as an employee. And as an employer, I need to let people know that I'm not like creepily watching them, but like, Hey, I think you have a lot of talent. I'd love for you to join my team someday. And so, so now I think as an owner, I've been more forthright in saying that, like I've been known to say to people like, Hey, I really think you're going to work for me someday. And they're like, okay, that sounds great. <laughs> but, um, but I want to be inspirational and keep them informed as to what we're doing so that when the time is right, it's not this, let me tell you about my company. It's more about let, what's it, what's it going to take for us to make this work? Yeah. I do the same thing. Yeah. You can come work for me one day, you know, be, <laughs> right. I do that all the time. So next let's talk about content. So I think there's two uh, things I thought out there. One is, you know, don't push out a lot of content out cause you put, too much, too, put out too much content. It's going to, you know, water down your brand. No one wants to read all that stuff. And then you'll know, have people like Gary Vaynerchuk, like, you know, more content, more content, more content. What's your theory on that? Yeah. So it's funny because I, I, I do appreciate a lot of the things that Gary Vee puts out. I think the challenge if if you're going from someone who's who's not created a lot of content to the, well, Gary posts every day, several times a day, people often don't peel back the, the um, external perspective and see he's got a team that's producing all of that for him. Plus, like if he gets 4% engagement on a 5 million person following, it looks like he's got just like crazy amounts of followers. But like proportionally, he probably gets as much engagement as I do on on my Twitter account and I only have about 3000 followers. Right. So I think content, um, these days you can definitely produce too much, but usually what happens is people try to produce more cause they think it's about the frequency and, and amount that they, they push out. Um, and what I tell people, it's usually less about like frequency is important, but what's more important is showing up consistently. So if I say, Jason, every two weeks, I'm going to send you an email. I need to send an email every two weeks. 
if I'm going to send you, if I'm going to post on, on Facebook daily, I need to post on Facebook daily. Cause when you stop or when you alter that behavior, you suddenly open up the door to people trying to figure out what's going on with you. Oh, he hasn't sent an email in two weeks, but he said every two weeks, is he okay? Is he still in business? And, and people do make up their own stories when you don't follow through on what you tell them. Um, I also see a lot of people like there's a lot of COVID-19 emails going out right now. And there's a lot of them, but I swear I could just delete the name of the company and copy and paste them across every single brand because they're all saying the same stupid thing. It's important that we educate our customers, but you know, for God's sakes, please give me a personal approach to how you're handling the situation, not just the same corporate, you know, jargon that everyone else is using. So I think it goes down to like creativity, consistency of showing up and then having like, you have to have something worth saying. And if you don't, you probably should re-examine your positioning, like period. And that's a hard thing to, to swallow. So this is my pet peeve about the other COVID-19 stuff going on, going on. Like I know there's companies out there heard her say, we have this offer, you know, free remote coaching, free remote this, but you're, you're a remote company. Like, I don't get right. it. Like, like, are you kidding right now? Like this is what you do anyway. And I just, I don't know. That's a pet peeve of mine, you know? Yeah. I think that, um, we were just joking about content strategy internally. And I said, I don't think anybody in, in the tech industry wants to see another email about how to run a remote team. Now, what you might want to see is can banks even go remote? Here's five roadblocks you're going to run into. Like, cause, cause a bank is used to being in a bank every single day. So they're going to have the article that you wrote about being remote when you are a virtual technology software development company is not the same value proposition that a bank needs to hear right now. So I think, I think now is a very, very unique time to create that like really specific content for a specific industry that's going to be facing this COVID crisis in a very unique way. And that, again, that takes time and people often like just want to shortcut their way through stuff. So or, or how about if you own a cleaning company, you know, how do you, how you do remote for cleaning company? You still have a clean builders, right? But how do you work through that? You know, that'd be pretty valuable, I think. Yeah. I mean, if you really, if people wanted to, to uh, talk about like who's hiring right now, and I, I will tell you what, like, I'm pretty sure there's a lot of, of restaurants who are going to need to have extra workers if they continue to do carry out delivery, because people aren't going to wanting to be go out into that environment. But, um, how do you say that lightly in content? You know, that's hard. Yeah. And this one I'm just saying, like, once this all over with, right? All these companies, hey, all your workers come back and work down at five, you know, come come do your hour ride one way and hour ride back home and so on. People are like, hey, hold on, wait a minute. We prove we can work remotely. And you want us to come back, you know, that's not gonna work, you know. So that's gonna be an interesting dynamic, I think, coming up, I think. Yeah, I think that the people that are creating content around what they think is going to happen as a result of the, the changes we're going through, I think that's interesting content. And I think that, you know, there's going to be some of it that's wrong. But uh, as, as we're on this podcast, one thing that I'm finding interesting is um, I've noticed that if, so Jason, if you don't have an hour commute anymore every day, you might have listened to two podcasts that were hour long every day. And so now your commute is like, you know, to your bedroom or to your office and you got you got a one minute or 30 second commute. And so it, it might open the door to these like small five to 10 minute podcasts, you know, snippets every day versus this once a week, 60 minutes. So how we consume content, I think is changing. Uh, people are looking for interpretation of data because I don't know how many cases of COVID there are. I can't figure out where they are, but if I can see it inside a visual, that's much different than a news article from the New York Times. So I think those are the things that are, are definitely impacting us from like a consumer perspective. And I, I know that's going to impact how B2B companies market as well. So Ali, speaking of, uh, of data, how important is analytics to marketing? Yeah. The, so the one thing that I tell everybody about, about analytics is you, there's, there's this like, there's this myth that because everything is digital now, you can still me you can measure everything. You should know where every single dollar, you know, is going and what it gets back to you. Um, I still think it's a good thing to strive for. I still think, um, my personal belief is you're never going to be able to track everything. And, um, especially in light of, of some of the things that make it possible for us to track are things that consumers are pushing back and saying like, Hey, don't track me. <laughs> I don't want you to know that. Um, and so we're fighting that with consumers, but, um, you should, you should at a very bare minimum know what your major sources of traffic to your website are. You should know what those audiences are doing on your website, what conversion actions they're taking, and you should know what is growing your main assets, like your email list, your social media, people getting, you know, free resources. If you don't know the sources of traffic that are converting, you need to solve that at least, uh, you know, at a bare minimum. Is Google Analytics still like the best one to use or there's something better than that right now? 
I would say there's, I mean, there's tools that are better than that. They're more expensive. I would say um, Google Analytics are probably the tools that are still the most universal. And they're the ones that um, if you go looking for answers on how to, how to do things, especially if you're, you're really ramping up your content game, um, it's going to be the most easy to use in terms of like the amount of resources that are out there to help you do that. Yeah, I saw where you took the Google Analytics Academy. I did the same thing. And we're going to look at just so much information, right? It's just it's overwhelming because, yeah, it's just it's craziness. How much stuff is on there? Yeah, I think that what I run into with most people trying to learn, like marketing at all, let alone analytics, it's like they go in wanting to learn the tool and it's almost like getting a car but not really learning how, how the rules of the road work. And so you just... <laughs> you're driving through parks and you're driving on sidewalks because you don't actually know what you're supposed to do with this car. And so I think with analytics, if you go into it saying, I need to find out these things or, or this is my hypothesis, how do, I, how do I track this information? If you go in with scenarios, then you can actually learn in that, like within that scenario. And then as your learning grows, you, you keep layering it on top and then you, then you eventually like understand the whole suite. So Ali, I know there's like, you talk about different tools. I know there's the SimRush, there's Ahrefs, like there's literally a dozen of tools out there that cost money. Any, any one better than the other one, any recommendations or it just depends on individual preference? Yeah, for content, um, you know, one of the things that, that people struggle with, with content is at least when I've, what I've noticed when I've gone in and helped people fix their strategy or, or align a new one is they write content that's interesting to them. And what they don't actually do is write content based on the way people talk or how, the way they search. So, so SEMrush and Ahrefs actually gives you, they, they both give you data from the web relative to search queries. So, so you, might, you might say the question, Jason, um, how do I track uh, visits to my website from social media? That might be the actual long form like search query or, or what we call long tail search that you would use. And, and a marketing company might think, I'm gonna write a blog post called um, how to use blah, blah, blah filter inside Google analytics to view search behavior relative to like, like it's just, it's not language that anyone would use. And so HRS and SEMrush can give you those actual ranking terms. And then they'll, they'll expose you to a lot of things like backlinks and, and how other content's performing. But in and of itself, I think there are free tools out there like Uber suggest is one. Um, there's, there was another, uh, keyword plugin that I think they just made free. So that probably doesn't apply, but um, you can get a seven day trial of Ahrefs for $7 and SEMrush has an introductory thing for free. Um, so I'd say if you're, an, if you're a content marketer and you're not using either of those tools, you're definitely missing a big opportunity to create content based on like an informed picture of what's out there on the internet and how it ranks. Ellie, so who are some marketing people that you follow that you, that you, you know, you agree with what they're doing? Yeah. Well, the cool thing is in our office, we have, we have five rooms and each one is named after a famous marketer. And so I'm actually, um, in the, uh, Gary V, v uh, video studio. So we've got a Gary V studio, um, and Hanley with marketing crafts, excellent, excellent, excellent content marketer, really good with copy. Uh, she's got a free, or I think a discounted course on copy going right now in light of what's going on. Um, Ogilvy, any, anything from Ogilvy, um, they're a little bit higher as far as like big agency, but they put out some excellent content. Um, Seth Godin, the father of, of, you know, marketing, I think <laughs> I've read every, not, not only the father, the granddaddy, <laughs> the granddaddy. I've read all of his books. I keep saying like, I want to be known as like the, the female version of Seth Godin. Uh, and then, um, a Rand Fishkin, the founder of Moz just, um, he was the person that really like inspired, I think what I believe to be modern, like video, um, content marketing. Uh, they started their whiteboard Fridays before anybody was doing like whiteboard videos online. And so I just, I love, love, love what he's been doing and, uh, follow all of those companies religiously. Yeah. I used to follow uh, his whiteboard Fridays all the time. I read a lot of those and I love Seth Godin's, um, like daily blogs. It's like, it's, it's like not even a paragraph, right? Yeah. Yeah, he's an excellent example of one, he's built an audience, but two, you don't have to be verbose to be um, profound. Mm. And if you have established your own unique perspective and you stick with it, people come to consume content from you in short bits. And they, again, I said, if I can, if I can write 140 characters and get, you know, 5,000 shares on it, I feel like, I feel like I've, I've reached the pinnacle of influence at that point. Yes. Yeah, so Allie, back in 2019, you put a post on LinkedIn that says, People buy from people they trust. Can you talk about that? 
Yeah, that whole post was written around the concept. Uh, if you're in financial services, which there was, there was a client of mine a while back that, that, that was in like heavily in that area, but it's called Center of Influence or COI. Um, and COI is, is sort of an old, I'll say old school because it's originated a long time ago, but technique where you identify certain people's that have influence in their communities or their networks, and you build relationships with them with the intention of actually getting referrals and passing referrals. Um, now, from a broader perspective, I think what I'm noticing in marketing is you're seeing sales development representatives who used to be known as just like pick up the phone and try and schedule the meetings. They're, they're having to create um, as much awareness for their brand as they are for the company. So um, if you haven't read, it's called Phonetical Prospecting by Jeb Blount, awesome book, but he's got a whole chapter in there about how to do social selling. And I would say that it's not even selling, it's social influencing. And so people wanna buy from people and nobody wants to, nobody says, I love company XYZ because of the logo. They love the experience, which comes from the humans. And, uh, and I think that that's, that's just, that's the future of content marketing. And, and obviously this podcast that you're, you're hosting is, is, you know, key of that. Ellie, who's your target customer? Uh, yeah, but so on the simple strat side, our, our target customer, there are CMOs and, and VPs of marketing inside of, uh, uh, SaaS, SaaS companies, SaaS technology, um, and, and B2B service companies. Um, from brand plan, that platform is actually built so that, um, any B2B company can load in their marketing strategy, load in the research that they found about their customers, um, all of their brand standards, brand guidelines, messaging, and then actually plan campaigns and share that with their whole team. So in that case, it's more about just B2B companies probably have at least two employees or two marketing, two marketers or more. Um, so, uh, but we're building the wait list over there yet. So, so not actively requiring or acquiring customers yet. And so do you focus on startups as well? Uh, we do help startups with products. Um, startups typically are a little bit more volatile when it comes to, uh, like doing what we would call like a partnership, um, like a content, like where we're actively helping them on a monthly basis, uh, unless they're venture backed. And, you know, in that case, they've usually got some targets they have to hit. So, uh, but a lot of times startups, you know, they need like, Hey, what should we do here? So let's, let's do a 30 day engagement where we help them figure X, Y, Z out. And then, and then they kind of go on their way. So. so how, how, how is the star community in Nebraska? Is, is there even one there or how's that? How's that? Yeah. Yeah. So where I'm based in, um, we actually have a very, very, um, uh, active startup community. And, uh, in fact, our, our startup that, that is involved in this like giant picture that I just described brand plan, uh, just got, um, one of the local grants that is awarded to startups. Um, so we actually have some, some good support from the government here as far as like grants and funding and that kind of thing. It is definitely more difficult to raise money in the Midwest due to the more, little bit more conservative mindset. Um, and the fact that, you know, you can't throw a stone and hit a startup on every corner here, which is both good and bad. So, uh, but I would say that, you know, there's a good community of fellow supporters and you can definitely reach out and, and build connections and resources here. So Ali, next, can you talk about your journey, uh, your entrepreneurial journey? Like how did you, how do you even decide to become an entrepreneur and like the pros and cons of what you've been doing so far? Becoming an entrepreneur, I think is one of those things you're born with. But for me, I didn't quite realize that until I was, a, you know, past the point that everybody else thought that I should have been an entrepreneur before I, before I actually made the, the move. Um, hindsight's always 2020. I look back and I, in high school, I had a cake decorating business. So, uh, I actually worked at the local pizza hut and I would sell cakes to customers and my boss actually thought it was fine. So I would, I would tell them all about my thing. And then my friend and I would bring cakes in and actually have them in the back room and then br bring them out and sell them, which probably would not fly today. Um, but we were doing that. I had a photography business. So I, ha I always had some sort of side hustle. And then um, ultimately, uh, I pitched an idea at a startup weekend, and it was this health and fitness app. It was uh, it really, actually a really good idea. It, um, we won the competition. We had a working application and then encountered the problem that almost every startup goes through. And that was the people that felt the pain didn't want to pay for it. The people who would pay for it didn't feel the pain. So it was this like multi-sided realization that you got to follow the money. And if the money's not there, then, then you got to figure out, you know, how it's going to get paid for. And ultimately uh, that's when I decided to just move into the consulting world and then eventually, you know, launch my own companies. And, and that was about uh, that seven, eight years ago. So. Yeah. I remember reading something somewhere that, that there was a study that said most entrepreneurs, like in, when they were kids, they either had lemonade stands or had a side hustle or like, like they did something, you know, so it's always been their blood system, so to speak. 
Yeah. I didn't, nobody in my family has ever owned a business. Nobody in my family has ever, um, launched anything out of, you know, out of thin air, I guess you could say. So I, I honestly didn't realize as a child that that was a thing. Um, I, I went to school because that's what I thought you did. And college was wonderful. I learned a lot of things in college, but, um, I learned everything that I know about business by working in business and working for very smart people and then working with very smart people. Uh, and, and to be honest, failing, you know, a lot. Uh, so, uh, school of hard knocks, I think as well. That's one thing I think people don't realize when they start a company, how many times you're going to hear the word no over and over and over again. Right. Yeah. I don't know. Have you seen that, that, uh, hundred days of rejection experiment on, on, uh, like a Ted talk? Yeah. 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 That's one of my favorites. I, I go back to that often. Cause I think, I think back to that, like comment that I made about that employee who I thought was going to say no. Um, so many times in life we, we like build, our, build ourselves up to, to hear a no when in fact we should just ask because we might actually get a yes. Um, so. Yes. Ali, can you talk about why human resources is important? Yeah. So human resources at our company, um, you know, I, I still am our human resources officer, I guess you could say we have some, uh, we've employed some external um, help along the way with, you know, things of, of legal aspects or, um, you know, we worked with a recruiter for a while. Um, but I think, uh, you know, if, the way I see human resources as a, as a small team um, is definitely improving that experience. Like what does the employee want to get out of this? Do they understand their role? Um, how do we deal with all the logistics? Like we just deployed uh, Gesto as a as a platform to to manage like time off and, and payroll and that kind of thing. Um, but at the end of the day, it's about making sure that they get to where that where they want to go. Um, it's it's a seamless experience, and then we get value out of that that allows the business to grow. Ellie, what, what's your vision for your two companies? Like in, like what's the long term plan? Yeah, the long-term plan is to um, so simple start. We have a couple of other technologies that we've we've actually uh, come up with over in that company, and uh, we want to continue to provide um, uh, value from a content perspective, and probably keep that team um, rather small um, as we continue to grow technology out of that. Um, for brand plan, uh, you know, my vision is for every company to use this platform as a way to build, communicate, and, and visualize that strategy across the company. So you're using this in your yearly planning session, you're using it in your weekly marketing meetings, um, you're sharing it with an investors, and, and you're helping get your brain around this idea of marketing strategy and how it actually becomes real and, and built into tactics. So, um, you know, I hope to be right up there one day with, you know, the HubSpot and the sales forces of the world, but obviously we have a, a long way to go. Ellie, um, I understand you have, you have something for our listeners today. I do. I do. We have um, a whole page of resources on our website, which uh, Jason, I understand you'll put in the show notes. Um, we've got guides that, that range from, uh, you know, if you're, if you're considering a, a software like HubSpot, we've got a guide to, to help you through that. Um, if you are looking to use video in your social strategy, we've got a guide for how to get started. Uh, we've got a marketing plan template. If you're trying, if you're, if like this whole COVID-19 has you going back to the drawing board, you can go ahead and download that. Uh, but we've got a whole page with that. And, and again, we'll make that available to you, Jason. Can you share social media for both yourself and your company so people are going to reach out to you? For sure. Yeah. So uh, my social media, I tend to be pretty active um, across multiple platforms, but you can find me uh, just my handle on every platform is Ali Schwanke, which is A-L-I-S-C-H-W-A-N-K-E. And uh, my company, Simple Strats, is Simple Strat on all platforms, S-I-M-P-L-E-S-T-R-A-T. -E, um, and except for Twitter, because somebody squatted on our name there, and, and we are Simple Strat Chat over on Twitter. If for listeners, we'll have the links to uh, her gifts and her social media on the show notes. And you can find the show notes at www.cabinetshtrawblog.com. And also be sure to share the Jason Cabinet's experience with everyone. So, Ali, next question How do you disqualify someone? What's your process for that? Because everyone is not a good customer, right? How do you go about disqualifying someone? Yeah, they, they aren't. You're right. Like this, say, the thing that I heard in sales, you know, years ago that still holds true is sales, your process needs to be disqualified as, as quickly and, and, um, as, as hard as you can. Um, and disqualification for us would be if, if they think marketing is going to be the answer to all of their sales problems, that's a bad sign. <laughs> marketing is not, um, typically in a B2B company going to be, uh, the answer to all your sales problems. Um, if they are looking for uh, a silver bullet, um, there is no silver bullets. There might be some quick wins, but there's definitely not a, we're going to swoop in and save all the things for you. Um, and then a third thing is, uh, you know, misunderstanding of time or money. So if, if 
the results are we need this in 30 days and on average for every company we've ever worked for it's taken three months that's not a good fit um and then just just budget you know if your budget's a thousand dollars a month uh regardless of us or any company you're going to be limited as to what you can do with that compared to ten thousand or twenty thousand dollars a month so that's just kind of some some rough frameworks that we've used so uh, you're, you're you're based in nebraska but you you take customers all across the united states correct we do actually most of our um clients are outside of of the region um mostly for the reason of uh there's back to your question about startup there's there's not a plethora of B2B tech companies uh, in Nebraska, but we definitely have our fair share here. We just, uh, if we limit ourselves by geography, we won't have a very big customer list. So how do you market your company? Yeah, we, we practice what we preach. I think that's one thing that sets us apart from other content agencies or even agencies in general is um, Fred, day one, I, I never wanted to be that company that says you should do this, but <laughs> don't look at us. So uh, we use content, we use, um, you know, outbound strategies, as well as, you know, things like this, just building relationships in the industry and, and helping before selling. So Ali, let's, uh, let's suppose someone is watching this and they want to start their own company. What advice would you to give them? Yeah, I think one of the things that um, I, I got advice for when I started this company was um, always, always, okay, let's see, hush up with this. Never assume that you've got everything figured out um, all the time. So even when you start the company, um, even if you have a good month, that doesn't mean, okay, all of a sudden now we need to go get a new office or we should invest in this technology or we should hire five employees. Like you're going to have ebbs and flows. And so build your, your, you know, cushion so that when you're ready to make those big decisions, you actually have that cushion there. So if, if after you invest, you've got a couple of months that, you know, don't go the way you thought they would, you're not going to go out of business because you've, you've used that cash that comes in as somewhat liquidity. And instead you, you haven't been somewhat conservative in your approach, especially since we haven't taken any outside investment. So that's good. Ali. So we're coming to the end of our talk. Can you give us any advice on any subject or any, anything else you want to talk about? Yeah, I'd say advice for, for marketing right now. You know, again, if you're listening to this right now in our current situation, um, one of the best things you can do is, um, you know, revisit what your marketing calendar looks like for the next year. Um, I think people right now are hoping this is a short-term thing, which which hopefully it is, but it's, it's certainly going to um, impact how we communicate with people long-term. So I think people's inboxes are still going to be overflowing. I think we're still going to be inundated with content as we move forward out of this this um, challenge that we're in. So pare down what you're doing to the most essential value and the unique value that you can drive for your customers. And then uh, make sure that you have a way to, uh, to track that back to your analytics conversation to make sure that you're, you're uh, seeing what's coming from your efforts. Ellie, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for having me. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. And remember to be great every day.